Welcome, Welcome to, to Hero, Hero Club. Club. I'm Nick Williams. And I'm George Primavera. George and I started playing Dungeons and Dragons with our buddies in college, and we haven't stopped since. Even when we lived on opposite coasts, I would Skype in George on the TV in the living room of my apartment. While I would DM from the floor of my bathroom so as not to wake up my roommate. When I finally came out to Los Angeles, we started playing with our friends right away. And when we'd inevitably tell other people about the ultimate betrayals and daring heroics that happened in our games, we realized that they were just hearing a jumbled mess instead of the cinematic blockbuster memories that were in our heads. We wanted to show people how fun and immersive immersive D&D can be, especially those who had never played. And to do that, we record a full game like normal around the table and then painstakingly cut it down from four hours to a clean, math-free episode so you can experience our memories the way we do. Just like in a real game, nothing is ever written or planned out ahead of time with the players. The only things we add are music and sound effects. I am the dungeon master. I build the world and the framework for an adventure. The players, like Nick, must then journey through the obstacles I set before them, rolling a 20-sided die and adding character-specific bonuses to see if they succeed. If they beat the number I have in my head, then their action is successful. If not, it is a failure, and there may be consequences. We try to follow the rules of Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition as close as we can, but as the Dungeon Master, what I say goes, and there are some things I like to do differently. Each season is its own contained story, so find one that sounds interesting to you and start from the top. And hey, welcome, welcome to, to the, the club. club. This week on the podcast, our guest is Karen Fukuhara. Make sure you check her out on The Boys Season 2, now streaming on Amazon. And now, Hero Club presents The City of Mirrors, Volume 3, Over Al Jazeera. Daily Globe Trotter is proud to present this week's top scoop from across the globe. Reports have confirmed that Theobald Derencroft and his team of specialists have made their way to Oslo, Norway, in pursuit of a lead that may bring them one step closer to finding the legendary lost city of mirrors. While it is unclear if they have found anything of significance in the subterranean ice caves, the crew surfaces once again with a new destination in mind, the Ottoman Empire. Could this be the location of Theobald's Golden Goose, or is it simply yet another wild goose chase? Either way, the Daily Globetrotter will be there, so stay tuned. This week's bulletin is brought to you by Williams Brothers Revolvers, the safest revolvers in the Western Hemisphere. Order our free booklet today, send your name on a postal, and it will be mailed to you free with our full catalog. Williams Brothers Revolvers, shoot to thrill. Now, back to the program. After having made their way back through the underwater ice caves, Hans piles the crew into the automobile and brings them back to the Wyvern, still parked on the lawn of the Norwegian Museum of Cultural History. Theobald gives a fond farewell to Hans. Hans, my dear man, it's always a pleasure, and if you're ever in London, please do not hesitate to call on me. Oh, of course, my friend. Thank you for visiting Oslo. Now get the hell off my loon. Bones slides open the window in the cockpit and yells out to Hans. All right, Hans, give my best to Yermu, Uwen, and especially Yesaku. You can say good boy yourself. Say goodbye, Yesaku. Took me with you, Bones. Uh, so I can't hear you over the sound of the plane. Bones starts aggressively flipping switches back and forth. Took me with you. Ah, the propeller, I'm just still getting used to this. He just slowly slides the window closed. <sighs> Someday, I'm gonna marry that girl. The behemoth aircraft jostles slightly as the air currents buffet the steel exterior. Nickelback sits in the co-pilot chair, arranging some little tchotchkes on his control board, and turns to Bones Mahoney in the chair adjacent. You should get some rest, sir. It will be nigh on 12 hours before we reach Baghdad. Bones wakes up from a full-blown sleep. Huh. <sighs> Where am I? In the pilot's chair, sir. Right. Flying a plane. I should maybe uh, get some rest, Nickelback. A novel idea, sir. Bones pats Nickelback on the back and then heads down the ladder towards the main cabin. 
As Bones reaches the main common area, he sees the rest of the crew going about their nightly rituals and preparing for bed. Dressed in a traditional nightshirt and cap, Vanya goes through his nightly ritual methodically laying out, counting, and organizing pieces of scrap metal, old food cans, artillery shells, blasting caps, and wicks. He bundles his materials together, holds them close to his chest, and in an almost cute way, snuggles into his little cubbyhole and goes to sleep instantly. Jade is bundled in a thick wool sweater, sprawled out across the bed, her hair hanging loose around her face, a little drool coming down from the corner of her mouth, and her silver pointed hairpin clutched in her hand. Fast asleep. Theobald still sits at the galley area, poring over the note and translations that Hans helped them find. Fret not, for I have taken the apple from this sacred place and will journey to the first city. Any idea what that gobbledygook means, Doc? Oh, Mr. Mahoney, I haven't the faintest. Not yet, at any rate. So let me get this straight. Someone beat us to that apple thing and left that letter. And if we can catch up with them, maybe they can lead us to the lost city? Oh, I'd say it's more than likely, my dear man. And of course, we've already gained access to the greatest treasure of all. A destination to travel to and companions to do it with. Well, sure, that's all well and good, but friendship don't pay the lease on my trailer. Or for the campground that that trailer is parked on. Or put beans on the fold-out table inside of that trailer. Oh, don't worry, Mr. Mahoney. I am more than prepared to fully compensate everyone for their expertise. But I want you to know that I am grateful for your company and your efforts in the meantime. Well, sure, Doc. This job ain't half bad. I could be back mucking stalls and taking hits for laughs on the rodeo circuit. You ain't smelled stink till you've been a rodeo clown in Ismay, Montana, I'll tell you that. Oh, that certainly does sound invigorating. I would quite like to try. Everything going smoothly with Nickelback in the cockpit, I trust? Oh, it has been an honor flying this beautiful bird. Well, I can think of no better man to fly her. Thanks, Doc. Again, Mr. Mahoney, I'm not a doctor. Why don't we catch some Z's, Doc? It's been a hell of a day. Bones wraps his knuckles on the table, heads over to his bunk, and bodily throws himself in, wearing his full day clothes. Theobald makes no move to get up from the table and keeps looking at the letter. Who knows? Perhaps we will face down the Ottomans together, with an apple in our hands each. Theobald lets about another hour get away from him before turning in himself. The night passes uneventfully, and soon the sun shines overwhelmingly through the windows of the plane, the curtains in front of them not quite up to the task of blocking the bright rays. A voice crackles over the Atlantean earpieces on everyone's bedside table, a little shelf sticking out of the barren steel wall next to each sleeping cubby. Good morning, everyone. We are 37 minutes from the airfield in Baghdad. Ready yourselves to disembark. Oh, wait, what the? Jade throws her hairpin sticking straight into the wall above her. She sits up way too fast and bonks her head on the tiny ceiling. Oh, oh, bugger. Theobald, almost fully clothed already, bolts out of his cubby and pulls a belted khaki field jacket off a wall hanger next to them. Well, rise and shine, everyone. Tis a new day. Vanya scrambles out of his cubby, all the organization he did with his materials, gone to waste as they scatter to the floor. Ugh. All right. Someone is going to need to slap me. Bones rushes to be the first one to oblige Vanya, but also whacks his head on the top of his cubby and takes a full header into the floor. <laughs> Jade steps lightly over Bones' body and approaches Vanya and gives him a swift smack to the face. Jade, roll an attack. Ten. Vanya takes one damage bringing him down to 74 points of health. There you are. Top of the morning. Good morning, everyone. Vanya scampers off, fully awake, starting to get dressed. If anyone else needs a slap in the face, (laughs) just come to Vanya. I will do it for you. Thank you very much, Jade. Anytime, my friend. Bones pops up and loudly cracks his entire back. Those cubbies are small. Not the smallest bed I've ever slept in, but small. A necessity of the design, I'm afraid. How is everybody feeling this morning? 
If I may quote the bard himself, all things are ready if our mind be so. Henry V. Jade, having recovered from her head bang, now doing some rather remarkable stretching on the floor, says, Soon as I get some coffee and a big old breakfast, I'll be right as rain. Well, you're in luck, little lady. You just happen to be in the presence of the best eggs and bacon maker this side of the Mississippi. Come on, let's get breakfast going. Did somebody say breakfast? Oh, wonderful. I've always wanted to have a classic American breakfast, which is why I had one when I went to Montana to recruit you, and I quite enjoyed it. Nickelback, in the hallway behind, unnoticed by everyone, walks forward with a tray full of perfectly cooked eggs benedict, notices that everybody is getting together and bonding over a homemade breakfast, nods to himself, and slowly backs out of the room. Theobald notices at the last second, and while waving Nickelback off, mouths, save me some. Bone strides all confidence into the commissary, pulls out the necessary ingredients along with a cast iron skillet, and then begins to one at a time crack an entire carton of eggs into the hot frying pan. Bones, make a cooking check. Nine. The eggs come out a little overdone, but edible. However, smoke essentially fills the cabin, causing everybody to cough. Unperturbed by this, Bones moves on with the process, slapping several large pieces of bacon onto the frying pan. Roll another cooking check. 23. Soaking up a little bit of the leftover oil in the pan, Bones makes some perfectly crispy bacon, and the smoke slowly begins to dissipate, getting sucked through vents out into the air. Bones enthusiastically plates up the breakfast and passes it out. My cooking philosophy is that the bacon should be the best part. As the smoke clears within the cabin, with a plate of breakfast each, the crew looks out the various porthole-style windows to see eroded hills and incised streams with spider webs of flooded alluvial soil spilling excess river water in bizarre patterns, though with generally consistent direction, exceptionally flat and empty with the glimmering reflections of civilization far off in the distance. Everybody, make a history check. 15. 6. 14. 29. So, this is a place without frigid snow, eh? Well, I should say, my dear Vanya, chaps, it appears we're flying over Al Jazeera, Arabic for the island, named so in the mid-7th century because of how it is cordoned off by the Euphrates and Tigris rivers. Blimey. Just beautiful, isn't it? There is always beauty in learning things that you do not know. Never seen anything like it with me own mince pies. Excuse me, everyone. Would you mind joining me in the cockpit for a moment? We are coming up on something I think you should all see. Theobald basically sprints to the cockpit. Vanya follows, as does Bones. Jade stuffs one last piece of bacon into her mouth as she climbs up the ladder. (sighs) As the crew gathers in the cockpit, and stares out the wide convex window, you see a massive stretch of open and flat landscape, punctuated by an unnaturally large, dark brown mesa, a flat stone plateau that seems to spike out of the ground like a mountain with the top cleanly cut off. There appears to be some activity on the ground there. I haven't gotten quite a good look because I have been reticent to make our presence known, but- And it is just then that there is an enormous amount of interference on everyone's earpieces. And amidst some harsh static, a new voice becomes audible. Mayday! Is anybody out there? Please, if anybody is out there, please respond. I am asking for assistance. Yes, hello, this is Theobald Derek Croft, the explorer. Who am I speaking to? Hi, hi, this is Penelope, Penelope Kim. I was here with my professor, Professor Kismet. We we found this artifact, but she had to stay behind. I'm stuck in a cave anyway. I, there are these men out there, and I am afraid for my life. They are carrying weapons, and I can tell you more if if you can if you can help me. Please. We will head to you post haste, Penelope. What is your location? I am at Black Brown Mesa. My team and I shall arrive directly. Fear not, we're on our way. Thank you so much. How far away are you, do you think? 
You're in luck, my dear. We're right on top of you. Right above? I, I, I don't understand. Is, are you able to reach us? Are you... And the line goes extremely staticky. Jade takes her earpiece out. Sorry, Gov, but could this be what they call a trap? Theobald takes out his earpiece. Oh, I'd say it's about a 50-50 chance, Miss Pickett, but that's all part of the fun. Vanya takes out his earpiece and starts marching down towards his stuff. But it sounds like there's a 100% chance of people that we need to kill. Yes, quite, old bean. Bones, my lad, as an experienced body man, am I correct to assume that you have some experience with firearms? What? I can't hear you over the static. Why has everyone taken their earpieces out? Are we going down to the mesa? Yes, we don't know who could be listening. Take your earpiece out, man. What? Got it, taking her down. Bones grabs the controls and starts the descent. What? Oh, bother. Theobald climbs down to the main cabin and heads to his trunk. Bones and Nickelback spot an open stretch of very flat ground, an easy task, and their altitude drops rapidly in a controlled dive. Bones make a flight check. 22. Easily traversing a few rough air currents, the plane settles next to the mesa. There is suddenly a figure cresting one of the sediment ridges. It waves to you enthusiastically, if not a bit desperately, and the wyvern's engines wane. Huh. You know, that could be that lady from the radio. Penelope is standing on the ridge, dressed in straight head-to-toe khaki. She also holds an enormous backpack, a hiking backpack to be exact. It's stuffed. How many days has she been in this cave? In this enormous backpack that is probably half her size, she's only about four foot nine, there is a radar dish with wires hanging out. The cave that Penelope is standing in front of, just behind this sedimentary ridgeline, has a few scattered objects within, but is otherwise completely barren. She seems to be alone. Everybody make a perception check. 10. 9. 19. 10. Theobald confirms she is indeed alone. Shall I watch the plane, sir? Yes, Nickelback, I think you'd better. And be ready for trouble. It's times like this I'm happy I'm a hopeless insomniac. Nickelback reaches to a hidden compartment and pulls out a sawed-off coachman's rifle. Bones shimmies down from the cockpit and begins throwing on his leather flight jacket. Theobald approaches him, holding a coach gun that looks similar to Nickelback's, but with an extra barrel on top of the original two. Mr. Mahoney, do you recall my Shakespeare quote earlier about preparedness? Uh, you mean word for word, or...? And in the cockpit when I asked you if you had experience with firearms? Uh... Good man. I've made improvements upon the standard sawed-off coach gun. This shotgun here will hold three charges instead of two. Theobald pushes the gun into Bones' arms. Be ready for anything, old chap. He turns on his heel and heads to the aircraft door. Uh, Doc! Doc! <sighs> I'm not really, uh... Bone slings the shotgun over his shoulder and heads out of the plane. Vanya comes up from storage, tightening a leather buckle, strapping himself into his flamethrower. So, who here is killed before? As Jade straps in the last of her daggers, I doubt kiss and tell. As the party disembarks the craft and heads up the ridgeline, Penelope runs down, tripping over herself to greet them. <laughs> Hey, it is the lady from the radio. Theobald strides up to her and extends his hand. Miss Kim, I presume? What? Are you from the future? I'm afraid not, my dear, but perhaps my thinking is. Theobald grabs Penelope's hand and shakes it vigorously. My name is Theobald Cedric Plimpton Daringcroft, and this is my team. Here's my American cowboy pilot, Bones Mahoney. Uh, this is our demolitions expert and, and a gifted man of science, Vanya Peronov. And here we have our locksmith and detector of traps and hidden compartments, Jade Pickett. Penelope stares wide-eyed at all of you for a moment and then regains herself. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Oh, it's our pleasure. Not too far out of our way. Is it alright if I ask for some water? I'm parched. Oh, of course. How thoughtless of me. Uh, here. 
Theobald pulls out a canteen and hands it to her. Penelope rudely grabs the water bottle and gulps it down. (laughs) As water dribbles down her chin and onto the dust below, she turns tail and begins to walk back towards her cave, calling for the rest to follow her. Come with me. Well, you heard her, chaps, right away. The cave is shallow, only about 20 feet deep. Penelope shucks off the tremendous backpack as the radar dish clangs onto the stone. This thing is so heavy. An empty canteen lies discarded in the corner, and a few books and pieces of food sit in a neat pile adjacent. We've been down here for three weeks, and we found some amazing, amazing artifacts, but I'm ready to go home. On the other side of this mesa is the dig site. They have Professor Kitchmond on the other side. They've captured her, and I don't know how to help. Bone sidles up next to her and flashes his signature pearly white smile. Well, you're in luck, little lady, because we're good for more than water. Nice. Vanya stares in wonder at the radar backpack. Did you make this? What is this? What does this do? Explain yourself. Professor Kitchmond has some wealthy benefactors. That answered, I think, only half of one of my questions. Oh, give the girl a break. She's been here for three weeks, probably out of her mind. Miss Kim, I understand this contraption is how you were able to contact us? Yes, this is our only form of communication down here. The professor just told me to keep switching dials until I found someone in this frequency. Very good. And... The professor and and these uh, sinister men holding her, they don't have any sort of means of listening in to us, do they? No, I, I, I don't I don't think so. Very well. Then Miss Kim, please point us to the dig site. Follow me. Everybody make a stealth check. Eight. Twenty-two. Seven. Sixteen. The party creeps along the exterior of the mesa, sticking close to the rocky face that looms above them. However, it becomes quite clear that Vanya's heavy equipment is hindering his ability to step carefully over the rocks. And Theobald's excitement is getting the better of him. He stumbles once in a while as he moves a bit too quickly for his own good. After about a mile of walking, Penelope stops everyone dead. If we crawl up there, we'll be able to see everyone. Uh, Doc, you might want to sit this one out. Your dogs are barking awful loud and... As your body man, I think you might be safer down here. I have to agree with the big guy. We can take it from here. Well, I refuse to be doing any sitting out, but I couldn't agree more. I am making a dog's breakfast of this silent approach. Miss Kim, is there any sort of uh, ridge or plateau where I may take position and provide support from afar? Uh... Oh, you could try climbing up the cliff of the maimed man... Over that way? She points to a sheer and extremely dangerous looking outcropping of rocks with just a few visible footholds and handholds. It looks hazardous, to say the least. Splendid, I'll try that. Theobald turns to the rest of the party. Now remember, the professor's safety is paramount. Pip, pip! Theobald turns on his heel and goes to scale the cliff. Theobald unpacks his climbing equipment and Penelope, Bones, and Jade continue up a small rocky pass leaving Vanya behind to decide for himself what to do. All right, they're going to need a way out if things get hairy. And the distraction. I'm going to rig this entire valley. And Vanya disappears behind a very large rock, with a mischievous smile on his face. As almost an afterthought, Theobald turns around. Oh yes, Vanya, old boy, we're going to need a way out if... He's gone. Well... Up we go! Make an athletics check with advantage as you use your climbing gear to assist you. Fifteen. Theobald makes his way up. A a treacherous climb to a remote perch. Black guards in the valley. Unclear how many foes lie in wait. This is without a doubt my favorite part. And on the ridgeline... Jade, Bones, and Penelope settle behind some three-foot-tall outcroppings of stone and gaze at the dig site. The encampment rests against the side of this enormous mesa, with a few modest tents set up at the center. Surrounding these tents are objects of great technological advancement. 
automobiles with enormous treads instead of tires sitting idle. They are each a solid 12 feet tall and 18 feet long, about 10 feet wide. The backs of these vehicles are loaded with bags and crates, and a few figures walk between the vehicles and the tents, a few cradling large objects in their hands. Everybody make a perception check. 11. 15. 14. Jade and Bones both spot that the large objects the men are cradling are clearly rifles. And then Penelope pipes up. I, I've never been able to access that part of the... There was a wall there. And Penelope points to men descending, it would seem, a staircase that leads down into the mesa. What are they doing? Theobald, as you climb, make another athletics check. Nat 20. Theo, as you climb, one of your pitons suddenly comes loose from the cliff. There is some sliding above you, and rocks begin to cascade from a sloped perch. Theobald lets one hand go, dangling from the other piton, as the rocks fall past him, missing him. And then he resets. I say. Over everyone's earpieces, Vanya's voice begins to crackle. <laughs> All right. If you need a distraction, just let me know. Please need a distraction. Yes, and if it does come to a fight, I should uh, be there to support you momentarily. And Theobald finally crests the very top of the mesa. <sighs> As Theobald moves to the edge, he sees two men standing in front of him, gazing down into the valley with their backs to him. They're about 200 feet away. Theobald's hand shoots to his mouth, and he drops to the ground, prone. Back on the ridgeline, Jade, Bones, and Penelope stare at the milling soldiers. Jade turns to Penelope. How long those trucks been there? They rolled up eight hours ago. And how long's your boss been missing? I, I, I would assume they captured her immediately after we had parted, so maybe seven, seven hours. She gave me this. And Penelope goes underneath her jacket and pulls out something wrapped in dirty linen, unfolds it, and reveals a small, skinny golden rod that ends in a hook. Very small, though, about the size of a candy cane. It's very ornately decorated with runic symbols. This is the most valuable thing that we've found at the dig so far, but we have no idea what it is. If you ask me, it's some sort of Christmas ornament hanger. Don't think the Mesopotamians were celebrating Christmas. Why well, do you know? Were you there? Cutting to Theobald back on top of the mesa. Theobald slowly unshoulders his rifle and looks through the scope at the two guards, trying to make out any recognizable items or symbols on their uniform. Make a perception check. 19. One of the men has a bag, sort of like a fanny pack, strapped around his waist. And on this fanny pack, you see a symbol. Eight arrows point outward from the center in all directions. Make a history check, Theo. 25. You immediately recognize the symbol as the Arms of Chaos, a symbol made famous by the old German mercenaries, the Hessians. Oh boy, Hessians. Theobald whispers into his Atlantean earpiece. Hello everyone, it's me, Theobald Derencroft, the explorer. I'm afraid there are two centuries in the position I was planning to take up. They haven't seen me yet. How is everybody else doing? We're over here looking at a whole mess of blokes with guns. I say we get the big ram to make a big, big noise like he likes to do. That draws their attention away. I know you like that one, buddy. That draws their attention well away from us. Meanwhile, we scoot down there using all our stealth and free the misses and, um, get any little uh, pieces of treasure we might find along the way. Could not have come up with a better strategy myself, Miss Pickett. Vanya, old boy. I met the place already. I will light the match when you say so, and it will be so much worse than you think it is going to be. All right, Jade, so what's the play here? My big thing, and you know, it's just my personal preference. I don't want to go down into that cave knowing that there are guys out here, and potentially guys down there. If I'm going to get stuck into a tiny hole, I want to make sure there aren't guns going off. Why don't you and I take out as many as we can before we go into the cave? Yes, I should say, do your best to eliminate as much resistance out here as you can. Speaking of which, Gov, 
Eh, I'm no stranger to the odd uh, felony or warrant, but is uh, killing people over international waters something you're going to deal with in terms of the paperwork? Oh, you know, that's funny, Jade. I, I never really thought about it. Well, well, yes, yes, fine. Next point of business. Radio lady, you should probably stay here while we go forward and, uh, do the bashing and whatnot. It's safer that way. Uh, are you sure? I mean, how experienced are you with these weapons? Bones raises up his two sizable fists and flashes that smile again. Been using them all my life. So, I don't know if that instills confidence in you or not, but there you go. Jade puts a hand on Penelope's shoulder. Oi, kid, you stick to the learning. Let us do the fighting. Okay. Uh, here, take this. Penelope opens up her backpack and takes out a statue of a monkey with a skull in its hand. The statue appears to be made out of some kind of ivory, though it seems to gleam like an opal would. There's a cryptic dead language carved into the base of the statuette. Uh, we found this a, f a few days ago, and I'm not sure if it's of value, but maybe it'll keep you safe. Penelope hands the monkey statue to Bones and says, I feel like Jade probably has this under control, but maybe this will help you. Oh. Hey, thanks. Bones, make an arcana check. Six. You notice nothing about the object. Bones, thinking it's probably trash, shoves it into his heavy coat pocket without a second thought. The monkey statue's eyes flash a deep red, but Bones does not notice. Right, I'll go just ahead of you. I'll start taking him out, and as soon as somebody starts getting wise, you come in with your guns. Well, see, I don't know if I made it clear by holding my fists up earlier, but I'm really more of a, a punching guy than a gun. <laughs> And then a massive explosion, like a wave of thunder, washes over the plane. <laughs> and the camp is suddenly in chaos, as uniformed men start sprinting between tents and vehicles. Penelope dives for cover. Oh shit, okay, I guess we're going. Bones hops the lip of the ridge and slides down towards the camp. Bones, make an athletics check. 18. Yeah. Bones effortlessly slides down the rocky face, sprinting up to a very taken aback guard. And walloping him across the face with a big fist, using the entire momentum of his run. 24. Huh? Ah! He drops unconscious. Having tackled that man to the ground with the full weight of his body and his punch, Bones rolls forward and sprints towards the next man. Oh my god! The man quickly tries to unjam his rifle as Bones approaches. At another dead sprint, Bones uppercuts the Hessian. 19. Ha! The man's head bounces off one of the armored vehicles and he is still in the dirt. Bones turns back to Jade on the ridge and waves his two fists in the air in an attempt to signal her to come down. Kaka, kaka! And doesn't notice three soldiers approach from the tents, rifles raised pointed at Bones' back. Cutting to Vanya, who is holding a spent detonator in his hand and is standing in front of a massive crater. <laughs> Vanya takes his whole action to sprint, looking for his next target. Jade hears Bones caca from the base of the mesa. What a bloody nutter. And she jumps into a beautiful cartwheel flip dive down to the base and throws two daggers at the men behind Bones. Make an acrobatics check as you make your way down the slope. 26. Jade puts on a dazzling spectacle of acrobatics before reaching Bones' level. Roll your attacks. 14 and 14. One of the daggers hits the leftmost soldier in the jugular. Blood starts spurting out as he falls to the ground. The other two soldiers look at him in horror, just in time for the middle soldier to get knocked by her second knife in the temple. Friedrich! Ah! Carl? Back up on the mesa, Theo watches both sentries swivel towards the sound of the enormous explosion with their rifles raised. Theobald takes aim at the man on the right and fires. 22. 
And before the other man can react, fires at him as well. 16. Well, we tried. Theobald moves towards the edge of the cliff. Penelope peeks her head out from behind the rocks to get a view, and is immediately surprised by two falling bodies on either side of her, and ducks back down, shocked. The soldiers, however, are starting to gather themselves, organizing. Many of them are distracted by the explosion created by Vanya, but several are starting to get wise to the assault at the Mesa's base. Four soldiers explode out from behind tents, with pistols and rifles raised, and open fire on Jade and Bones. Jade effectively avoids all of the shots headed her way. But Bones takes a bullet in the leg and a bullet in the ass and takes 30 damage, huh? bringing him down to 45 points of health. It feels like both bullets have grazed and passed through, but boy does it hurt. Bones digs deep, shaking off the piercing pain. And Bones gains resistance to piercing, bludgeoning, and slashing damage. He spins on the third man who didn't get knifed by Jade and attempts to take him out. 18. Uh, uh, that'll teach you to shoot me in the ass! Bones ducks for cover behind one of the trucks, so as not to get shot again. Vanya, far in the distance, as you sprint towards the camp from your slightly farther away position, you see, a couple hundred feet in front of you, the glimmering cars sitting adjacent to the tents in the camp. Your keen eye clocks them at approximately 210 feet away. Vanya pulls out an improvised explosive, shoves it into his hand mortar, takes aim, <laughs> and fires. Boom. 16. And one of the tents immediately starts to catch on fire as the explosive showers incendiary materials down on the tent below. While the soldiers are distracted with fire and bones, Jade sneaks over to the flaming tents to look inside and see what's in there. Make a stealth check. 18. Ducking low, Jade starts sneaking through the camp stopping short as two guards sprint past her, responding to Bones' commotion, and she reaches the tents. The one nearest Jade appears empty as she lifts up the tail and just finds papers stacked in boxes. Jade turns to the tent that's on fire. Inside are open crates of guns and weaponry. Make a perception check. 14. Smoke is filling the tent as the top is blazing now. But in a box at your feet, you notice a bunch of small, stick-like objects with cylindrical tops. Oh, bugger. This place is gonna blow. Cutting back to Theo on top. Theobald, prone at the edge of the cliff, looks through his scope down into the camp. Make a perception check. 13. Looking through your scope, you have lost track of Bones, who appears to have disappeared behind some of the automobiles. But Jade is in the center of the camp and staring into a burning tent does not notice a gigantic seven-foot-tall Hessian soldier wielding a wicked-looking machete walk out of the opposite tent and stalk towards her unnoticed. Miss Pickett, get out of there! You've got company! Peering through his scope, Theobald fires around at the man's center mass. Roll an attack with advantage. 25. Hit. And another. Nat 20. 43 damage. Describe it. On the first hit, Theobald is positive that he hits the man's heart. But instead of going down, the giant turns around and looks directly up at Theobald's position. So the seasoned marksman puts another one through the man's eye. Jade turns just in time to see the man forced into the dirt. Oh, my angels are with me. No sooner has the man hit the ground than Theobald, using guerrilla tactics he learned in the Boer War, traverses 15 feet before immediately hiding once again. Roll a stealth check. 19. Several soldiers start to stream towards the fiery tents, but can't quite get to them, as they've been very distracted by a raging, screaming Bones Mahoney. Come and get a taste! I'll take down every last goddamn one of you! Two of the soldiers rush into Bones holding long knives. Both narrowly miss their swings, but as Bones is busy with these two soldiers, another two approach from the rear and fire two shots at his back. But Bones, sensing the danger and hearing the clicks of the hammers on the pistols, huh? ducks forward at the waist and both bullets pass overhead. Bones picks himself back up, reloads his fists in a shucking motion, and then flashes that signature smile one last time before throwing a punch each at the two men in front of him. 17, 26. With a right hook and a left hook respectively, they go down hard. 
He then throws two powerful elbows at the men behind him. 18, 21. Come on, you Hun bastards, I could do this all day long. Cutting back to Vanya, who is sprinting ever closer to the encampment, Vanya spots a couple of soldiers, cock rifles, and aim at him as he sprints across an open field. Vanya reaches into his coat and takes out three scorching cherry bombs, loads them into his hand mortar, takes aim, licks his finger to judge the wind, <laughs> and fires. Twelve? The first cherry bomb lands a bit short in the dirt, and there's a puff of fire, which quickly dissipates. Nat 20. As the men begin to laugh a little to themselves, one of them is suddenly alight with flame. Botch. This cherry bomb fires into the air, almost at a vertical angle, and explodes completely uselessly far above. Pista! Stepping over the giant man and his machete, Jade walks over to the other two tents to have a look inside. The first tent, where the large man came from, appears to have nothing in it at first glance. However, peeking around more boxes and stacked crates, you see a figure sitting on the ground, seemingly tied to a large wooden post. Jade grabs the dagger from her other boot and approaches the figure. Jade sees an older woman, probably in her late 60s, mid 70s. She seems unhurt, though a bit dirty and haggard. She wears all khaki and a pair of broken spectacles rest around her neck on a beaded chain. Hello, love. Yeah, you must be the professor. Jade takes her dagger and goes to cut the ropes. As soon as the knife touches the ropes, the professor's eyes shoot open and she makes some muffled noises, trying to get around the gag that has been put in her mouth. Oh, right. Jade comes around to her front and tears off the gag. <coughs> she did it. She got help. Well, get me out of these ropes, would ya? Yes, we'll get you safe and sound, but in the meantime, step lightly. There's lots of action afoot. The old woman slowly gets to her feet, definitely needing some assistance. Jade takes the woman's arm and helps her out of the tent. As soon as Jade tries to grab her arm, she is shucked off. I'll be fine, I'll be fine. The old woman reaches into her khaki jacket, plucks out a small candy, opens it, pops it in her mouth. Mmm. Blood sugar's just a little low. Let's go. Soap yourself. Theobald surveys the dig site for any other guards going towards Jade's tent. Make a perception check. 17. Theo only spots one guard headed towards the tents. Theobald fires at him. 19. And the man drops into the dirt. Meanwhile, two more soldiers approach Bones, both with rifles raised. But Bones jukes and avoids both blasts. Vanya also finds himself the target of a long-range shot. Vanya takes 12 damage as the bullet grazes his shoulder, bringing him down to 62 points of health. And then it becomes clear that the rest of the guards, some of whom are running up the stairs and out of the mesa, are jumping into the front seats of their vehicles, and they begin to roar to life one after the other. The first couple of cars to turn on slowly begin to back up and peel away, retreating into the desert. Mr. Mahoney, don't let them get away! You got it, Doc. I'm on it. Bones grabs one of the men getting into a truck and slams his head into the steering wheel until he goes unconscious before hopping in himself. 26. Huh? Uh, uh. And he drops out of the car. Bones gazes at some confusing dials and buttons in the car. Bones, make an investigation check. 15. Bones, there are two pedals on the ground a steering wheel that seems pretty self-explanatory, and a lever on the right side. All right, Roy, now think. This looks kind of like a yoke and a plane. And these could be engine starters, I guess. Uh, this lever, it's a landing gear. All right, well, here goes nothing. Bones cranks down the lever and punches the right pedal with a big boot. And the car immediately starts accelerating forward. <laughs> Land plane! He takes off after the other Hessian trucks. Bones plows through two tents, the one on fire and one of the other tents, as Jade and the professor walk out of the third tent unharmed. Bones, two of the cars are already fairly far ahead of you. Bones keeps his foot on the gas and attempts to close the gap. Vanya loads up cherry bombs once again and takes aim at the trucks. 
16. One of the cherry bombs impacts on the side of the car, bursts into flames, and it looks like the car has been disabled. But then the vehicle continues forward, showing only a black scorch mark on the side. 22. The second cherry bomb, rather than impacting on the side of the car, finds its way through the driver's side window, blasting the glass apart, and the entire front of the car explodes into flames. 25. And the third fires into the front of the other car, and the front explodes. One soldier jumps out of the passenger side door, just barely avoiding the exploding vehicle, sees Bones' car approaching, and waves to him trying to open the passenger side door as Bones' vehicle approaches. As the man begins to open his door, Bones yells, Here, let me get that for you! And bashes the door into the man's head. 18. He is knocked back 10 feet and lies still on the ground as the car then travels past him. Jade, as you escort the old professor outside of the range of the smoke and fire, you feel the quiet. Well, I suppose that about did it. Jade turns to the professor. Now what could you have been after? That was so exciting to all these blokes. I'll answer everything in due time. But first, did you talk to Penelope? Yes, she's safe and sound. She sent us down here looking for you. Penelope! Penelope, where are you? Penelope pops up from behind the ridgeline and sprints down, tumbling over herself a little bit, but then catching herself at the bottom before falling. <sighs> Professor Kitchman! Are you okay? Did they hurt you? Penelope runs over to Professor Kitchmond and wraps her arms around her. All right. All right, Penelope. I'm so glad you're okay. Who do I have to thank for saving us? Good show, everyone. Theobald waves and gesticulates excitedly as he repels down from the cliff. Make an athletics check. Nat 20. With the grace of a ballet dancer, Theobald's boots meet dust and he strolls over. Theobald removes his hat and extends a hand to the professor. You must be Professor Kitchman. We were told all about you by Penelope. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance. I'm Theobald Cedric Plimpton Daringcroft, the explorer. This is my team. We're so glad to have found you safe and sound. How are you doing? I'm all right. A little shaken up. Listen, I know it might be rude to ask, but uh, are you that Theobald Daringcroft? The one who squandered millions of pounds on an insane mission to the Antarctic to find the lost city of Atlantis that wasn't even there? That one? Guilty as charged, I'm afraid. You have cut me to the quick, madam. True, I did find Atlantis, but I can't seem to remember where I put the damn thing. The professor smiles to herself. Well, we owe you a lot, especially considering how much of the dig site you managed to keep intact. Despite all of the fire. Bones brings his truck to a screeching halt on top of what has to be part of the dig site. Terribly sorry, but it was our pleasure, madam. After all, what better prize exists than to help a soul in need? I think we're all rather curious. Uh, what's in the cave? Oh, that. Well, actually, I don't know. <laughs> Everything okay? Who's this? Oh, yes, this is my explosives expert, Vanya Baranov. Plucky young whippersnapper who asked about the cave is Miss Jade Pickett. And the gentleman who parked on top of part of your dig site is Bones Mahoney, my American pilot. American cowboy pilot. Bones hops out of the truck, fixes his hair, and strides up all confidence. Hi, I'm Roy Mahoney, but most people call me Bones. Clarissa. You're a fine piece of American beef, aren't you? Well, little lady, they didn't crown me the cow king of the Ismay Rodeo four years in a row for nothing. Anyway, I'm Professor Clarissa Kitchman. I teach archaeology at Harvard. This is Penelope Kim, my top student, and now my assistant. And we were here studying the Mesopotamian ruins in the area. That cave wasn't there before. Used to be just a sheer rock with this incredible carving in it, 30 feet high. Then these fellas showed up in their fancy automobiles and dynamite and blew a hole in it first thing. A mural, you say? Professor Kitchman, you didn't happen to uh, take any photographs or, or take down any sketches of said mural, did you? Of course I did. I'm a goddamned archaeologist. And she walks to the tent, goes into a crate, lifts open a lid, and pulls out a folder of papers, sifts through them for a moment, and pulls out a perfect sketch of what must have been the mural 
on the rocky face, and it depicts a slightly crude but clearly lush orchard framed by an ornate border, almost like looking through a window out into a garden. If I didn't know any better, I'd certainly think this was the Garden of Eden. Yeah. Okay, Atlantis. Oh, Gov, is this what we was open to find too? More than likely, Miss Pickett. This is a this is an archaeological dig site within our coordinates, and I've just been handed an illustration that draws yet another parallel to the fabled Garden of Eden. I think it quite might be. Well, I'll let you and Crazy over here go into that cave. I think we're just gonna take what we got here and cut our losses. Uh, you, you don't mind if we commandeer one of these vehicles, do you? Certainly not. Have at it. But before you go, we would like to take a look at your hall, just to make sure we are not missing anything on our expedition. She unfurls the golden rod from the linen. Oh, yeah. That's what I sent Penelope away with. They were asking lots of questions about significant artifacts, so I thought hide it. It looks important. Theobald examines the golden hook. Theobald, make a history check. Nat 20. Theobald, you immediately recognize this object as some kind of key, noticing several indents and elements protruding from the long rod. Additionally, you find a few Mesopotamian symbols that you remember from a day studying joyfully in the library at university. Words that mean bountiful, lush, open in ancient Mesopotamian script. It strikes you that this object might be important to what you are looking for. Professor Kitchman, if I may, this artifact may actually be of great importance to our endeavor. Would you mind terribly if I took it back with me? Roll a persuasion check, Theobald. 19. The professor looks at Theobald dubiously, then to Vanya, and then to Bones, who is smiling his big shining grin. The corner of the professor's mouth lifts a bit, and she relents. All right. Well, I know you're a respectable fella. If I give you my address, I can trust you'll pass it on to me when you're through with it? Without a doubt, madam. Well, we'll be on our merry way. Penelope, say your goodbyes. Thank you so much for everything. If you guys didn't come down to save us, I don't know what we would have done. Theobald, I know... This might sound weird, and I, I just spent three weeks in a cave, but I swear I look better than I do, <laughs> you know, now, usually. Uh, th- anyway, here's my number if you ever want to have a coffee or, <laughs> you know, go out to see artifacts or... I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I'm stupid. Okay, bye. Miss Kim, I would love that. And if you ever find yourself in London... Do not hesitate to call on me at Bravegate Manor. Penelope blushes, toes the dirt, and the professor closes the door to the large armored vehicle, Penelope getting in the passenger seat, and they slowly make their way back through the desert, leaving our party at the entrance to this freshly excavated cave. Well, Jade turns to Bones, slaps him on the back and goes, Come on, princess, we're going underground again. This has been a Hero Club production, produced by Nick Williams, George Primavera, and Jack Quaid, with associate producers Marty Abbey Schneider and Dylan McCullum. Voice acting by George Primavera, Nick Williams, Marty Abbey Schneider, Dylan McCullum, Lelia Symington, Karen Fukuhara, Jackie Emerson, Jack Quaid, and Adam Rice Carlson. The City of Mirrors Overture, composed and produced by Matthew McCullum. Special thanks to Kevin McLeod, Ben Doyle, and Matthew McCullum for their amazing music, Maychan Press for their genius D&D 5th edition homebrew, Marty Abbey Schneider for his incredible artwork, and Ali Catanese, our hero. Follow us on Instagram at Hero Club Podcast, on Twitter at Hero Club Pod, and check out our website, heroclubpodcast.com. And don't forget to write us a review on your preferred platform. Thanks for listening, and welcome to the club.
<laughs> as daughters of natural sprinters. <laughs> 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 that's basically that's what it great. is <laughs> yeah. yeah 